now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning and welcome to the second best day of the week of The Real Investment Show. Of course, it's Thursday. Michael Leibowitz joining me this morning, talking all things Fed for next week. Of course, uh, next, uh, next week, we've got the FOMC meeting where the Fed will likely hike 75 basis points. But there are, you know, some rumors and innuendos and market futures predicting a small chance of a 1% uh, rate hike. You know, it's kind of like uh, cloudy with a chance of rain. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of where we are right now. We'll talk a little bit more about that this morning. Also, um, we'll get into a bit, you know, just kind of talking about the markets in general, what outlooks are. Again, markets are very detached from you know what's happening economically, um, but again, you know it's just it's been kind of the slow-moving kind of freight train uh, through the economy over the course of the last several months, and we'll we'll kind of talk some more about that. Um, you know, interestingly, the market just kind of remains at a big, broad trading range here. Really, now ever since you know kind of May, markets really haven't gone anywhere, and and more importantly. You know, we're at levels that we were back in in 2021. So, you know, for a lot of investors, they've kind of gone nowhere for more than a year now. And that's a bit frustrating. You know, after you have a very strong year like you have in 2020, where everything just seems to go up, all of a sudden you're kind of in a period of the market where it just just kind of goes nowhere. And that's 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 frustrating. It's disappointing. You know, it's not making money. Kind of everything you seem to do doesn't really kind of work out right. And that's just what happens in a bear market. And what bear markets do is they kind of grind on investors until they just kind of give up. And so that's one of the kind of one of the hallmarks of where we are. Another hallmark of, of a bear market where we're in. And again, now we're talking about just kind of bear market structures, as we've talked about before on the show. Technically, when markets are down 20 percent, everybody says, oh, we're in a bear market. But that's not really what a bear market is. A bear market is when you change the long-term price trends from rising prices to declining prices. And we haven't done that yet. We're still in a long-term bullish uptrend. But in markets like we are now, you do see some behaviors that are more common in what we deem historical bear markets. Now, one of those is, is where you have, you know, very big upside or downside days. You know, there's a kind of an old axiom about missing the 10 best or 10 worst days of the market. If you miss the 10 best days of the market, well, you know, you underperform the broader market, you know, you know, by a large degree over time. What nobody ever tells you is if you can just miss the 10 worst days, you vastly outperform the S&P over time because losing money hurts a lot more than just missing out on a game. But importantly, when you talk about the 10 best or 10 worst days, they tend to occur all in bear markets at the same time. In other words, you have these very big rally days where markets are up to 2 or 3%, and then you have a day where you're down 4%, like we were on Tuesday. Um, you know, it was interesting on Monday, we had a, a nice rally in the markets. We talked about it on the show, got above the 20 day moving average, and it was very technically positive. You had a 90% upside day. And that's when 90% of stocks are advancing in the market, right? So, you know, very broad advance across that. And, and typically when you see 90% upside days, that's very bullish. And so that means that you typically have more kind of bullish action in the markets to occur. The next day, Tuesday, followed by a 4% decline and a 99% decline base. So you had 99% of stocks in the market actually declining on Tuesday, which, you know, that's what you see in a bear market. So that, so the point here is, is, man, this is a confusing market. You kind of really know how you look at it. it. It's just a very tough market to trade right now. It, it seems like almost everything you do works out wrong, but that's typical of this cycle. And, and that's why we've kind of got to weather through this, try to navigate it as best we can, get out of this thing all in one piece. And then on the other side of this, everything gets a whole lot easier because we'll, we'll get back into just a buy the dip rally mode. But we've got to get there first. And so we've got to survive this process and try to make sure that we don't have, a, you know, a tremendous amount of capital destruction if this market does indeed uh, decide to climb further. Uh, a couple of other areas of the market that are interesting. You know, one thing we talked about on Monday a bit was the volatility index. And the volatility index is a measure of, 
you know, we call it the fear gauge, right? If, if volatility is rising sharply, that means investors are, you know, kind of betting on a market crash. And, you know, if it's not really going anywhere and, and declining, that means markets are, are more bullish and they're not really expecting a crash to occur. And right now, that's really what the market is. Despite we've been in this kind of churning, sideways, grinding markets, you know, the volatility index remains very contained. It, it, it's not spiking higher. Uh, as we talked about on Monday, you know, when you get into a bear market like 2020 or 2008, you see these really big jumps in volatility. You're not seeing any concern in the markets right now. And you saw this on even on the sell-off on Monday where we were down uh, Tuesday where we were down 4% you didn't see any signs of panic. I mean, you know, on, on Tuesday, yeah, volatility rose a little bit. Markets were down 4% in a day and, and the volatility barely moved. I mean, there was just really no sign of panic in the markets. It was just simply, hey, I'm selling some stocks and, you know, I don't like the inflation number. That's really what it all came down to. On the, on the other side of that, you know, we take a look at uh, crude oil, of course, and uh, yesterday, Joe Biden announced that if oil gets down to $80 a barrel, he's going to start refilling the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Well, that all sounds great, fine and dandy. We've had the largest drawdown in the SPR uh, basically in history um, to try to bring down gas prices. Gas prices have come down. So, hey, it worked. But now you got to fill it back up, which means you, ex you do what, right? You extract oil from other sources to fill it back up, which is going to reduce, you know, as you, demand's not really decreasing that much. Now you're going to have a, a bigger draw on supply trying to fill, refill these reserves. So again, oil prices here, very kind of depressed here as of late, getting very oversold, just triggering a buy signal. So we're actually in a very good position here that we're likely going to see a rally in oil prices up to somewhere between $92 and $95 a barrel. Oil stocks actually did fairly well yesterday as well. So again, just kind of keeping a watch on that. And speaking of commodities uh, in general, uh, the 10-year Treasury rate, um, you know, that's been rising here as of late. The last time we were three standard deviations above uh, its moving average in terms of interest rates was back in you know, basically late June, uh, kind of early July, and we saw a very nice decline in yields. That means bond prices are going up. So again, you know, we're at a point right now with interest rates where likely we're about to see interest rates come down, bond prices go up, just simply from the function that we've gotten a very, very extended move in rates short term, of course, higher rates impact the economy. That means other things slow down. Housing demand's been under a lot of pressure. Mortgage rates over 6%. We're starting to see the deterioration in home prices, the number of sales, et cetera. Interest, higher interest rates also affect other financing as well. And as the Fed continues to hike rates, that's continuing to invert this yield curve more and more and more. And of course, an inverted yield curve ultimately crimps economic economic activity, right? So you get that slower economic uh, activity, which leads to slower economic growth that feeds back into the stock market. So you kind of get all of, all other kinds of bad outcomes out of that. But uh, watch yields here. We're probably in a very good position to start seeing bond yields decline um, with bond yields probably coming back down to somewhere around two and a half to 2.6%. So it could be a good opportunity here. Increase your bond exposure here, at least short term for a technical uh, kind of a technical trade. All right, come back from the break. A lot of stuff to get into this morning. I know we already covered a lot just right out of the gate. Just Tuesday, it's Thursday, right? Just dump it all on you. Uh, but come back from the break, pick up with Michael Leibowitz, talk a little bit about the Fed. Next week, 75 basis points, what else they might say, because that's what's going to move markets. We'll be right back for more of The Real Investment Show. Get by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, for our daily commentary, newsletter, and latest blog posts on deficit reduction. It's on the website now. See you right in a second. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. It's back to school time, and for your high school student, it's time to fill out the infamous FAFSA form for college financial aid. Mistakes could cost you money. Our next virtual lunch and learn will help you maximize your free application for financial student aid, the FAFSA. Register now for this free lunch and learn with Danny Ratliff and Chris Liebham, Thursday, September 15th at noon at realinvestmentadvice.com. Filling out the 
of FAFSA is vital for getting financial aid. Learn how. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset your people. Realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Welcome back to the show this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. A lot of things to get into this morning. I thought this was interesting as uh, everybody's trying to talk about going, you know, electric. You know, Dodge just recently came back, came out and said in the next year or so, um, the Dodge Chargers and all this that they had brought out a few years ago kind of revived that whole Dodge Charger brand is going all electric. And of course, it has to come with its own little electric sound system so that you get the sound of a muscle car with that being all electric. Um, Ford going against the grain, of course, Ford has launched their all electric truck, their all electric Ford Mustang, announcing yesterday they, un they unveiled their new gas powered Mustang. So they are not giving up on the muscle car. And I have a suspicion that there's enough gearheads in this country that will keep opting to buy gas powered muscle cars as long as they exist. I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, we just met with a client yesterday, still builds race cars. So, you know, there's just enough people in this country that are going to keep going back and you know reviving the old gas powered cars oh, yeah. so nothing like yeah. it yeah it's just you know electric's all great fine and dandy till you can't charge your battery <laughs> so <laughs> uh anyway good morning michael liebwitz uh joining us uh live from his bunker in in maryland what's going on <laughs> good morning Thanks for having me on yep. today, Lance. Sure. Um, so yesterday, uh, before we get into it, yesterday you spent some time with uh, Adam Taggart over at Wealthy on kind of talking about the, you know, the markets. What were some of the takeaways from that conversation? The biggest takeaway was a takeaway I had by myself. So at the very end, <laughs> he said, he said, Mike, do you have a few words, a, a few words of, uh, you know, to help our listeners? And I said, yes, follow the Fed. And we've talked about that a lot before. Follow the Fed. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, don't fight the Fed. I've right. ruined the punchline already. Yeah, exactly. Don't fight the Fed. I said, don't fight the Fed when, you know, just like when the Fed's buying, you buy when they're selling, you sell. And I've decided that I'm changing the tagline to follow the Fed. Yep. Follow the Fed. When the Fed's buying bonds, you buy stocks, you buy risky assets. When the Fed's, Fed's selling, you you sell risky assets. So it doesn't mean you buy it, buy as much as you can, or you sell as much as you can based on the Fed. What it means is you have a bullish stance or a bearish stance. A bullish stance means you're more likely to, to own a lot of equities, potentially more risky equities, that you're willing to ignore some of the fundamentals a little more than you might, than you might be comfortable with. A bearish stance means that you have less exposure to the market, that you're holding more cash, that you hold more conservative companies, that you value fundamental valuations more so than you do in a bullish market. So, so my tagline is now follow the Fed. 
It's not do not fight the Fed because no one seems to get do not fight the Fed. Just follow the Fed. Right. Fed's so Brent telling needs, you what to do. Right. So Brent needs to get you a new T-shirt then. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll develop a hashtag. <laughs> uh, so, another T-shirt coming. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, but, you know, look, it's it's it seems, you know, readily apparent that that's the case. Um, but yet markets haven't really seemed to bought into that narrative so much as yet. I mean, the Fed's now ramped up to 95 billion a month in terms of their, you know, their um and balance sheet reductions and markets are actually you know they're holding in there despite that um you know we're in kind of this very broad trading range right now you know there's uh, certainly a lot of concerns economically that are, that's going on uh interest rates are higher the fed's hiking rates or we'll talk about their you know their actions for next week coming up but you know it's amazing that the markets are holding in as well as they are you know given the backdrop of what the fed is doing I think the market's playing a game of chicken with the Fed. Will the Fed do what they say they're going to do? And and you can break that statement down into kind of three things. One is the Fed has been very clear. They're going to get rates up to four, possibly even four and a half percent, what they call the terminal rate. And by terminal rate, it's just that's as high as Fed funds are going to go in this cycle. And the market, if you look at Fed funds futures or other, other type of uh, instruments, is pretty much there. They're on board. In fact, uh, Nomura is now saying the Fed may go 100 basis points or 1% mm -hmm. at uh, next week's meeting. So in that part, I think the market is priced, or at least the, you know, the bond markets are priced for what the Fed is saying. I think the disconnect is what happens next year. The Fed, at least Powell and many Fed speakers have been clear that Fed funds are not coming down anytime soon. So if you look at Fed funds futures again, starting in March, April, they start declining, meaning that they're starting to price in a chance the Fed is easing by the spring. And there's a big disconnect between this constant easing the market is expecting throughout the year next year versus a flatline terminal rate that should, according to the Fed, occur throughout the year. So that's, the, that's your risk. That's your tail risk is that the Fed is right, the market's wrong. And the other one is QT, which the market is seems to forget about. Fed is going to be is starting actually starting today to uh, September 15th is actually the day that, you know, it occurs. will start reducing their balance sheet by 95 billion a month. Mm -hmm. That's twice what they did in 20, 2018 when the markets took six, nine months, but the markets finally gave out. So, you know, the markets, I think, completely forgetting that the Fed is pulling almost 100 billion of liquidity out of the markets. Now, at first, it's not really gonna matter. It's not gonna affect things, but over time, what you're gonna start seeing are the most illiquid assets, the most illiquid investors starting to, to have some financial problems, and then it builds on itself. So, so we shouldn't be looking necessarily at the stock market at the price of Apple or Microsoft. It's going to be in, you know, some some foreign products, some um, some products that you guys have never heard of, you know, uh, subordinated CLO classes, right. things like that. But it'll slowly spread. It'll, it'll be like these hedge funds you've never heard of, but it'll slowly start spreading and spreading. Uh, but that's, you know, that's a topic for next year or well, very late this year. Yeah. And again, it's just it's one of those things that historically what happens is, is, you know, you know, the markets are just kind of in their own little world. And as the Fed's hiking rates and they're tightening their balance sheet, everything is fine. And then it's almost kind of overnight, either the Fed says something like they did in 2018 when they said, oh, we're nowhere near the neutral rate. And then markets kind of just gave up the ghost at that point and realized they were in trouble. Market declines 20% over the next couple of months. Um, or something actually breaks. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, it's fine. The Fed's hiking rates are reducing their balance sheet. It's all fine. Everything's functioning properly. And then one morning you wake up and, you know, some something in the credit market's broken, something in the housing market broken, you know, broke, whatever it was. And then all of these things start to the market starts to figure out that something's wrong. You know, this happened back in 2008. You know, Bear Stearns collapses and, you know, the markets took a little hit, you know, initially and then just almost immediately recovered and, and kind of wrote that off as a one off event. But that was the beginning of that credit market breakdown. 
And we haven't seen that event yet, but we may see an event where there's something that the market kind of ignores, but clearly signals there's some trouble in the credit market. And we begin to see, you know, volatility pick up in the market. We start to see credit spreads start to blow out a bit. And those are going to be our early indications that something's gone wrong. And the Fed has probably gone too far in terms of what they've been doing in terms of monetary policy. Right. And that's that's the risk. So the risk is what if the market's right? What if the Fed is easing by March? Well, there's a few reasons that might happen. One is that inflation is drops like a rock between now and then. No one truly expects it to drop enough that the Fed will really be easing by then. So then why else would the Fed be easing in, let's just say, March, April, May? Mm -hmm. That's because something broke. And if something broke, stocks are not going to be where they're at today. So, so yes, the Fed may, yes, Fed funds market may be right. The Fed may be easing, but they're not easing for good reasons. They're not easing to try to help the economy and because inflation is all the way back down. They're easing because something's broken. Right. So if you're bullish, I think you're betting that the inflation data drops like a rock and everything's all better, that we have a soft landing. And, you know, there are there are chances that happens. But there's also chances that something breaks and the Fed's easing or that the Fed just that 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 inflation is very slow and the Fed keeps rates up at four to four and a half all year. Yeah, well, look, and that's the, that's the thing is, you know, when we come back to it is, you know, if the Fed's hiking rates and let's assume you're right. And there's this possibility that we have this soft landing in the economy and, and inflation comes down and, in, and, in, and interest rates are at 4% of the Fed funds rate. Well, if that occurs and everything is functioning properly, the Fed's not going to cut rates. Right. I mean, the Fed will just leave interest rates at 4%. They'll say, hey, you know, everything's fine. Everybody's functioning. Everybody's happy with the 4% rates. Hey, we've got 4% money markets now. Everybody's good. Um, the, the, the only reason the Fed's going to be cutting rates is because something has gone wrong in the economy. Either you've got a fairly significant recession that the Fed's trying to cut rates to help stall off the effect of a deeper recession, or to your point, something's broken. And now they're cutting rates and doing QE, trying to bail out financial markets or financial institutions more likely um, you know, because they're so, you know, functionally strong, as we're always told, because uh, they always pass their stress tests, but we have to bail them out every time something happens. But, you know, if they're cutting rates and doing QE, there's a problem with the banks. And, you know, that's the one thing that how we get there. And markets aren't going to like that at all. You know, so it's a very different story between the Fed pausing rate hikes or stopping rate hikes. And, to, and it's a very different story for them to pivot and start cutting these things. Right. In in Vegas terms, the bullish case is an eight point underdog. And look, eight point underdogs win all the time, but most often they don't. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, you know, you're playing the odds, you know, what can happen and you're assessing probabilities to all of that. And that's what we do. Yeah. Um, so when we come back from the break, um, we will. Let's let's talk a little bit about next week. The FOMC meets next week. Now, this is going to be kind of interesting because. They just had their Jackson Hole Summit, and Jerome Powell made some pretty hawkish comments that really spooked the market following that, that, that summit. Markets recovered from that, kind of started writing off what he said. But, you know, next week, the Jerome Powell is going to have another iteration of that same speech and, you know, potentially hiking rates as well. So talk about how the markets may handle that. When we come back from the break, right here on The Real Investment Show, don't go away. The Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. It's back to school time, and for your high school student, it's time to fill out the infamous FAFSA form for college financial aid. Mistakes could cost you money. Our next virtual lunch and learn will help you maximize your free application for financial student aid, the FAFSA. Register now for this free lunch and learn with Danny Ratliff and Chris Liebham, Thursday, September 15th at noon at Real Investment Advice. Com. Filling out the FAFSA is vital for getting financial aid. Learn how. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. 
Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. Elon Musk recently took a large shareholder position in Twitter. He made some comments that Twitter should be the town square where everybody can freely have their opinions heard without censorship, etc. The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule. The staff at Twitter are apparently so triggered they were even stressed on their monthly day off for a day of rest. At realinvestmentadvice.com. It's called the weekend, folks. Anyone can sell you insurance, and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at Stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. It's back to school time for your high school student. Our next virtual lunch and learn will help you maximize your free application for financial student aid, the FAFSA. Register now for this free lunch Lunch and Learn with Danny Ratliff and Chris Liebham, Thursday, September 15th at noon at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. Um, okay, so a couple of things. Coming up next week is the... September FOMC meeting, and this is where Jerome Powell will have his next shot at talking about policy and making his comments about where he sees kind of the Fed focusing their attention. And of course, you know, this was this will basically probably be a reiteration of what he said back at the Jackson Hole Summit, which disappointed markets initially. And then markets rallied, you know, kind of fairly sharply after that. So, you know, it, it's interesting that the markets hear what the Fed says and then completely discounts it and then tries to you know, <laughs> have these bullish advances. And that may very well be the same case that we see again um, next week. But, you know, most likely, you know, the, the Fed's going to hike rates again. And, you know, I don't really I don't pr particularly see a change in their stance and, and you know, probably a lot of the reiteration that we'll see from Jackson Hole will be much the same. You know, Mike, what do you think? Yeah, there's nothing that warrants any change in their tone. I, I think what, what we all have to appreciate is what the Fed is trying to do. I think the Fed would love to bring interest rates up as soon as possible, but they have to avoid, avoid the financial instability issue. So they don't want to freak the markets out in layman's terms, right? So, I, I, you know, if Powell had his way and he didn't have to worry about stock markets and bond markets and other asset markets, he may have raised rates 4% six months ago, but he couldn't, he can't. He, he, he would destroy asset markets, put a bank out of business, and he'd be easing rates just as quickly. He'd be bringing rates to four and then back to zero within weeks if he were to do something that crazy. 
So he's walking his tightrope. So I think, you know, his goal is to get rates as high as he can as soon as he can. You know, not as high as he can, but to whatever he thinks the terminal rate as soon as he can. Because, Lance, we've talked about this. It takes six, nine, even 12 months before those rate effects really start having a big effect on the economy. So when he makes his move on uh, next Wednesday, we're going to start feeling that in March. <coughs> I'm sorry, in March, April, May, June. So it takes a long time. That's why if you go back to February, January, February, March, if he could have just raised rates to 4% back then, <laughs> we'd be starting to really feel the effect of it. Right. But but again, the market would have freaked out and he would have been dropping rates back to zero by by April, May, June. So so he's trying to do as much as he can without without creating financial instability. And, and it's a really tough job. I, yeah, I certainly don't envy it. But I think what what we all have to realize is that the Fed has finally realized that this bout of inflation is not the inflation that we've had for the last 30 years. This is, while, while very different from the 70s and 80s, it has some of the same roots in that behaviors are changing. We just saw with the rail strike, mm -hmm. employees and unions are emboldened, emboldened right now to seek higher wages. And people are quitting jobs and they're getting much higher wages. People are asking for more money. They're getting more money where there are a lot more strikes than there have been for a long time. And while they're getting the raises and the money, the companies are turning around and they're raising prices on their goods to basically pay mm -hmm. for those raises. And then as they do that, the employees say, well, wait, I'm not making enough anymore. And they ask for more raises. And that's a price wage spiral. And the Fed is desperately trying to avoid that. And how do you avoid that? You crush the economy. You, well, you, you bring the unemployment rate up. Right. And I, and I think, you know, two things about that um, is that, you know, one, I, I think that a lot of people, you know, don't really recognize the fact that, you know, these price wage spirals that we're having is – also going to keep inflation elevated for a whole lot longer than expected. Um, you know, everybody's right. kind of, you know, we're kind of focusing on housing prices and, and you know, energy prices are down, you know, gas prices are down at the pump, you know, this is great, so inflation is coming down. Yeah, you may be getting a little bit easing at the pump, but, you know, the, the energy component of the inflation calculation is about half of what the food component is, and food is still going up. And the things that you are paying for are still going up. And again, these wages, to your point, are feeding through to those prices, which is going to potentially make inflation a whole lot more sticky. And, you know, one thing I was, I was you know, it's, it's kind of like the Fed, and we talked about this before, you know, the Fed is using a lot of trailing economic data. They're looking at employment and saying, well, employment's 3.5%. You know, no worries right now. It's all fine. Um, the, you know, the data they're looking at and to determine kind of monetary policy is a, a, is a lot of lagging data that's also very subject to big negative revisions at some point in the future. And so the data you're looking at today is kind of like, you know, back in the day, you know, when you actually had maps and you didn't have Google Maps and you had the big map you had to unfold and, you know, your, your spouse is sitting in the passenger seat, you know, looking at the map and, and then he or she tells you that, oh, yeah, the, the turn was behind us. Uh, you, you missed your exit. And, you know, the good old days. And, yeah, and, and, you know, the problem is, is that's the way the Fed's driving right now. They're looking at the map. And unfortunately, by the time the, the trailing economic data catches up with what they've already done in rate hikes and those rate hikes in the future are still coming. And again, as you said, it takes, you know, six to nine months for it to show up. You're well past your exit of where you should have stopped raising rates and, and now that you've got additional rate hikes in there that are all still kind of compounding themselves. So, you know, it makes it very difficult to navigate, to your point, the soft landing in the economy. And this is why historically, when the Fed's hiking rates and, and doing this, it generally winds up with either a much bigger recession and bear market or some type of crisis event, you know, related to the credit markets. Right. And I think one thing that makes this experience different from what we've experienced in our careers is I think what they fear is the biggest problem. And they'll never come really come out and say it outright, but they've said it behind, you know, in different ways, kind of hidden a little bit. It's the labor market is their problem. Yeah. The labor market remains extremely tight, meaning there just are not enough workers and too many jobs that need to be filled. Now, some of that is easing a little bit, but that's the problem. And as long as there's this much leverage with the employee, they can ask for those raises. 
And that's the problem. And I, I think that until we start seeing the unemployment rate go up, the jobless claims start start rising in earnest, and some of these job openings decline, those type of figures, and there are some lagging, there are some that are a little more current, but they're all sort of lagging indicators. Mm -hmm. Until we start seeing real problems in the labor market, the Fed is going to feel like they have no choice but to keep their foot on the brake. Yeah, and uh, look, and, and that's coming. Um, you know, the the layoffs, the you know the the wage declines, all that's coming. It's just a function of time until we get there. Um, the National Federation of Independent Business was out yesterday. And even though optimism ticked up a little bit, you look at the internal measures of, you know, what's kind of going on within these small businesses, which make up roughly, you know, 50 to 60 percent of the employment in the country. They make up a very big chunk of, of the economic activity. Um, you know, earnings expectations for these companies are dropping sharply. Um, you know, hiring expectations are dropping sharply. Um, you know, their economic expectations are dropping sharply. So, uh, you know, they're becoming much more contracted in terms of their outlook for their business over the next six to nine months. Um, as the Fed continues to hike rates, you know, they're already bracing for this, but they're already starting to see that impact of slower sales growth. Um, uh, of what's happening, you know, a lot of the indicators that, that they look at in terms of measuring the health of their business and their outlook are all starting to show signs of, of, de of more serious deterioration. It just hasn't quite fed through to the rest of the economy yet, but it's clearly coming. It's just a function of time. Yeah, and what's interesting, I think it was in last week's commentary, I don't remember which day, we showed a graph. And essentially, job growth has now fully recovered what was lost in February, March, April of 2020, the big declines in jobs. But what's interesting is that jobs at large companies has grown by roughly 10 percent and jobs at small companies have declined by double digits. Right. So, so yes, the, the small businesses are suffering. And if you look at their employment data, it's not as cheery as what we see in the in aggregate for the nation. But a lot of a lot of business has shifted towards the large companies and those large companies can afford to have employee more employees than they need. They have a lot more wiggle room, so to speak. Right. So so this whole, you know, raising the unemployment rate may be a little bit harder than it than it than it should be because you're dealing with larger companies that have the ability to give raises, that have the ability to hold on to employees that they really don't need versus small companies that are just fighting for every nickel and dime and will lay someone off if they have to or reduce hours. Well, and also, uh, too, to. and also, too, a lot of this employment data that you're looking at and, and you know, your point's taken, but, you know, large companies only make up about 10,000 companies in the U.S., so there's only a finite number of employees that they right. can hire. But what's been supporting the employment data, and there's been a big detachment between what we call the household survey and the, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics official report, the one that you see, you know, all over the media, there's been a very big divergence between the household survey and that official report. And of course, the official report from the BLS comes from the household survey data, and then they manipulate all the data with mathematical adjustments to get the official report. But what's been interesting is, is that one thing that's supporting the low unemployment right now, right now is the number of multiple job holders has now surged to a record. So in other words, right. people are employed and they do have a job. They just have three of them. And, and that's keeping them on the employment rolls. They're just working three part-time jobs. And I'm not sure that's really supportive of a strong economic growth rate when you just got a bunch of people working multiple part-time jobs. Be right back after the break. We'll wrap up the show with Michael Leibowitz. Don't go away.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. It's back to school time, and for your high school student, it's time to fill out the infamous FAFSA form for college financial aid. Mistakes could cost you money. Our next virtual lunch and learn will help you maximize your free application for financial student aid, the FAFSA. Register now for this free lunch and learn with Danny Ratliff and Chris Liebham Thursday, September 15th at noon at realinvestmentadvice.com. Filling out the FAFSA is vital for getting financial aid. Learn how. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now... Another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. Florida has now sent two plane loads of illegal immigrants to Martha's Vineyard. And uh, news, news headlines right now say that Martha's Vineyard was giving no heads up that migrants were arriving. So, <laughs> did I watch the news? Yeah, no, no. It's all fun and games until it's in your backyard. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember Florida getting the heads up either that they were getting those those people. Yeah, well, you know, again, you've got a lot coming into your neighborhood. I just saw just recently that you have, and uh, up in Maryland and around your surrounding parts, you have a big surge in the number of carjackings because there's now a TikTok challenge about how to hotwire Hyundais and uh, Kias. Ki and Kias. Yes. And one of the most prolific hotwires is an 11 year old. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, who you know, thinks he can drive? Yeah, who thinks he can drive? That's right. <laughs> you know, so just, so I don't know how, you know, TikTok lets that kind of stuff get out, you know, so I'm going to have a TikTok challenge about how to go burglar cars, but, you know. <laughs> Stuff happens on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, you know, kind of uh, as we were just saying a second ago, you know, it's very likely next week the Fed's going to hike interest rates by at least 75 basis points. And they could certainly come out and surprise the markets with a 1% hike. I think if the Fed really wants a shock and awe campaign that, you know, what they will probably do, would, well, what they should do if they're trying to actually shock the markets into coming down to try to get, you know, markets back in line with, you know, kind of where you know, you're going to start impacting, you know, consumer decisions and slow economic growth more. Because again, as the market rallies, that reduces financial tightening. It makes markets, you know, that makes kind of that's that's more accommodative policy, and it kind of works against the Fed because people feel, you know, the wealth effect is going up as markets rise, and so that encourages people to go out and spend money, which is keeping inflation elevated. Um, you know, but they do 75 basis points in September. The next meeting is not till November. So, you know, sometime in October, you come out with a surprise rate hike of like 50 basis points um, and do something intermeeting. I think you get a lot bigger effect on the markets potentially by doing something like that rather than just, you know, doing a 1% hike, you know, at this next meeting. What do you think? Yeah. You know, again, I think they should do as much as they can as soon as they can, but without freaking out the markets. And, I think they can 
probably get away with 1%. They could do 75%. And I think, you know, you, you wait two weeks, you see what happens after they do whatever they do next week. And if you can get away with another 50 or 75, you do it. But the thing that I keep that keeps cropping up in my mind, and the Fed hasn't done this in a while, but they can do they can raise rates or lower rates whenever they want. Mm -hmm. Right. If you remember back in 2020, they they didn't wait for the meetings to lower rates. They just did it. Yeah. Um, so. You know, and way back in the day, they didn't even announce it. They just they just lowered rates and you knew by what they were buying or selling. Mm -hmm. um, so so I keep wondering if they're going to do an intra meeting rate hike. Well, that's what so, I was saying. Like do something in October in between the two meetings, right. you know, because your next meeting is not till November. So you do something in October and, you know, kind of just shock the market a little bit and, and, and you know, put the market back on its feet saying, man, the Fed's a lot more aggressive than even we thought they were. You know, we haven't been taking the Fed seriously. We keep thinking they're going to, because, you know, after every time we raise high, you know, they hike rates or say something, then the market immediately goes back to, oh, well, they're going to pivot, you know, soon, right? We keep getting back to that, oh, the market, right. you know, the Fed's going to pivot soon. So you do something intra-meeting and maybe it, maybe that's what you need to kind of smack the market upside the head and say, look, stupid, I'm gonna, I'm tight, I'm hiking rates until we break inflation. I'm not pivoting anytime soon, and I don't think the market's getting that message. Right, and and this is, I think, what's going to be very important is, Fed's going to do what they do, but it's listening to what Powell says, or what slight changes they make in their statement. Um, Powell may likely just reiterate what he said at Jackson Hole, and the statement may pretty much be the same statement mm -hmm. they had from six weeks ago. But the week that follows, the two weeks that follow, every Fed member is going to be speaking. Powell will probably be speaking once or twice. And if they are going to go in for meeting, so say they go in, let's say, early October, mid-October, then you're going to start getting hints that they're not happy. Uh, Cash Carey said this, actually. After Powell's speech, the market had dropped, you know, a couple percent, and it was clearly based on what Powell said. And Cash Carey, in a roundabout way, said he was happy that the market fell two percent. And what he's saying is he's happy that the market's starting to take mm -hmm. the Fed seriously. Then the market just rallied after that again <laughs> and kind of slapped slap Powell in the face and said, yeah, haha, ha, this is funny. OK, you'll get rates to four percent and then you're just going to drop them again. Right. Uh, and what the Fed, I think, is trying to convince the market is, no, we're not going to just get them to four, four and a half percent and leave. You know, we're going to leave them there. That means in October of 23, they're still going to be four, four and a half percent, not, you know, three something like you think that they're going to be. Yeah, that's right. Um, so let's flip this over real quick. So how do you navigate this as a, you know, as an investor? Because I was talking about this in the opening segment this morning is that, you know, this is a really challenging market. So, you know, if you if you take a look at, you know, kind of the market itself, right? So just, you know, I, I'm, I've been invested in the market. You know, 2020 was great. And, you know, I, you know, I, I made a bunch of money in 2020. I could buy junk stocks and they just went up. 2021 was a very smooth ride higher. You had, you know, your dips were less than 5% at max. You only had a couple of those. And the market just kind of ground higher all year. You had a 20% 20, 20 plus return in 2021. 2022 has just sucked you know, across the board investing wise. But, you know, if you take a look at where the market is right now, you know, we're basically just, you know, going back to April of 2021, you've just kind of gone nowhere now for, you know, a, about a year and a quarter. Um, it's just been, you know, you had this big run up and you've given it all back up and you're, you're basically back to where you were in April of 2021. And while the market really is, you know, not gone much of anywhere this year, it's been very challenging. It, it, it you know, it really hasn't given up you know, a lot of its gains. I mean, we're still well above where we were at the peak of the market in, in February of 2020. And so, you know, overall gains in the markets, you know, are still positive. And, and by the way, this is the way the Fed looks at it as well. You know, Fed looks at, at this as saying, well, the wealth effect is still there. Yes, markets are down since the beginning of the year, but they're still higher than they were in 2020. So there's not a lot of destruction to that wealth effect in the economy, which is also potentially problematic for the Fed and their policy because that's also kind of leading into these more accommodative financial conditions. People still have money. There's still this wealth on the books. Um, and, and to your point, you know, they need to get potentially get the economy to slow down more. And that's going to impact, you know, financial markets because you've got to bring down that consumer confidence as well to slow that economic growth. 
you know, and those things are all working. But, you know, this has been a very challenging market, particularly in the last few months. Markets are just trading sideways. It, it kind of seems no matter what you do, you know, market starts to rally, you buy into it, then the market sells right back off again. And then you kind of buy the dip, the market rallies and it sells right back off again. You know, so you know, it's it's been really challenging, you know, to, to manage and navigate markets here and, and to make bets and then trying to figure out what's going to happen next because of what the Fed does. It, it's just it, it, it's, it's frustrating, but this is what markets do. And this is why investors eventually just kind of give up and get out of the markets because like I, I just can't, you know, nothing I do is working. So I'm just going to get out entirely. Right. I think what it comes down to is recognizing the trend and recognizing what's driving that trend. And we are in a bearish trend. Are we in a bear market on a Lance says no, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. We're in a bearish trend, just like 2020, 2021 was a bullish trend. It was just going up. You know, the, the dips were 5% at most. I think they were actually, most of them were less than two or 3%. It was just one at 5%. And that was a bullish trend and it didn't matter what you bought, everything just went up. And this year is different. So depending on whether you're a very active day trader or a longer term trader, have a bear stance. It doesn't mean that there are times where you don't buy stocks, where you don't get a little more aggressive, but it also means there that in general you keep less exposure and you you mind the risk you understand what the risks are what the bullish case is but also what the bearish case is and again lance you just assign probabilities to those cases and and do what you would do with any bet that you might make you know think about think about what could go wrong what could go right right and and that's and that's again it's it's been challenging because you know even if you you know buy a fundamentally strong company you know, it hasn't worked. You know, we've talked about Intel, um, you know, on the show before. Uh, AT&T, uh, it was interesting just yesterday, uh, over the, you know, this is conference month right now. And, you know, all over Wall Street, Goldman Sachs just had their big kind of uh, CEO conference this past week. And uh, AT&T CEO John Stanky said that the view, he has a very positive view on the 6% yield for AT&T stock. He, he likes it. It's very attractive. And he says it's going to be a while before AT&T is, is back in the dividend raise mode because they're still working to pay off its ele elevated debt pile. But he says the Apple's new iPhones are off to a solid start. Customers are under pressure uh, right now, and they are seeing a delay a few days uh, on paying their bills. But, you know, overall, here's a company that's got a you know, deep valuation. It's cheap fundamentally, just has not, you know, you buy these fundamentally strong companies and they just don't perform right now. Um, and that, that, that's, that becomes frustrating, too, for investors. Right. Intel's got a 5% dividend now. Yeah. Same thing. And there's a push to make stuff in America. Intel is very well situated for that. In fact, I don't know if you saw it, but Tesla is stopping building their battery plant in Germany and thinking about bringing it to the United States. So, you know, when you think about Intel, you think about made in the USA and that that is going to become a bigger thing. Yep. It's been virtually mandated by the government. All right. That wraps up the show for the day. We'll be back uh, tomorrow morning with uh, Financial Fitness Friday with uh, Richard Russo and Danny Ratliff. So tune in then. Three minutes of markets and money coming up shortly. Get by our SimpleVisor.com website. That's our digital research platform. You can track our portfolios, follow what's going on. Uh, we keep you up to date there. We always have some uh, special articles that we produce just there as well, just for those subscribers. That's you get a 30-day free trial. Try it out at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Get subscribed to our newsletter, daily market commentaries, so much more there for you to keep you up to date on the markets and the money and more. Realinvestmentadvice.com. See you back here tomorrow. It's a rich man's world.